David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Monday. It's the first Monday in October. Time for a new Supreme Court, uh, whatever the hell you would call it, session, uh, thingy. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. Now that I think about it, I'm not even certain. Uh, well, okay. I've lost the nomenclature for that. But anyway, I know this. It's uh, This is when they begin. And I guess this is the uh, time for the official investiture of... Justice Jackson, which we mentioned, I think, the other day was coming up. So that's somewhat good and interesting and fun news, except for the fact that the court, you know, has lost a lot of validity and uh, doesn't really make any legal decisions anymore. But, you know, she'll have a good time trying to uh, struggle against the mounting conservative uh, gimmitarianism, I suppose. Okay, well, I hope she's up to the challenge. It seems that she will be, and we can look forward to a lot of scathing dissents, at least for the time being. Okay, so many other things happening today as well, but I think I forgot to mention that at all in the morning post. It's uh, an odd week. We're going to be off Wednesday once again. I'm starting to think about, you know, how we'll handle Wednesday I mean, I won't be able to be on the air, but I'm starting to think that I won't really have an opportunity to record anything ahead of time either because there's all sorts of nonsense happening in between now and then as well, plus some serious stuff as well, but busy time, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping because there's an awful lot, but I don't know. We'll see what we can do about that. I can't make any promises because if I make the promise and then I don't follow through on it, one Of course, you're annoyed. And two, I'll have to atone for it all day Wednesday. So I got enough to atone for. I don't need to add anything new to the pile, I think. All right, let's see. Lots of other things happening today. Uh, As usual, an effort in my email to steer me in other directions, and not from good people that I trust, but from bad people that I don't trust. But guess who I'm going to give the attention to? The bad people I don't trust. I told you a while ago, I get, and I shouldn't encourage this, I should, you know, unsubscribe to this list and tell them to leave me alone, but now, of course, I'll be opening up all of these emails and looking at them, and they'll get the message, oh, he's interested, he's opening all our emails, but truthpr.com, the one who sends so many ridiculous, uh, weird, right-wing guest availabilities, etc., I don't know, sometimes I feel like I should alert you to what they're doing Just to see, I mean, even if nothing else, just to see whether any of these things pop up in the wing nutosphere in the days to come. Like, are we going to get, we're getting an early indication of what people are really going to be interested in in the right wing. And I mean, it's hard to predict that because they're so crazy these days. Or are these people just loons all unto themselves and living in their own world? And, And right now, I think maybe that's it. But just in case, I won't spend too much time on it, I say ahead of time. Just in case. What they're pitching today is somebody, a guest who, uh, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Okay, I've never heard of him. Not that I would have. Uh, but anyway, his shtick seems to be that uh, comic books are satanic. I mean, I don't think that's very new, but uh, I'm just putting that out there so you're on notice. Like, in a couple of days, we start hearing all over the place that, you know, right-wing uh Facebook memes about satanic comics are out there and they're going crazy about it, then we'll all say, oh yeah, I remember that that was going to be, oh look, and I have a new message from guest availability. They're listening to the show. (laughs) Yikes. Um, Anyway, uh, I guess in particular, he wants us to know that, uh, who else? Uh, Doctor Strange is particularly satanic, apparently. I don't know whether anybody else feels that way. And also, they're offering up some other names, and I don't recognize them, and I don't know what the hell's going on, so I'm not sure. Comic book fans will know. An excerpt from Marvel and DC's War on God. Uh, Doctor Strange, Alistair Crowley, Crowley, I don't know what, and uh, the Multiverse of Satanism. Part two, this is a part two, of a seven-part eye-opening documentary (laughs) documentary series. It's a documentary about, it's a documentary about comic books. They are real things. But the stuff that happens in them are not real. I'm not. I'm questioning the viability of a seven-part anything. But a documentary series that documents 
because that's what documentaries do, how popular comic books and the movies they have spawned are riddled with anti-Christ themes that glorify gratuitous violence. We do have that. Sexual perversion. I'm not certain about exactly where that comes in. Uh, blasphemy and the occult. We might as well get it all in there. I mean, maybe tight uniforms? I don't know. Anyway, uh, do you know who holds the keys to the real kingdom? Hint, it's not Disney. Um, I guess is uh, God, Jesus, somebody? I don't know. Uh, but not Doctor Strange? But he never really claimed that. Uh, I'm just interested in what's going on here in terms of craziness. Maybe they are listening to the show. I don't know. So I'm not sure what this follow-up is. I mean, I think it's just the same damn thing. So, I don't know. Maybe they found a mistake in their original email and they sent a new update. Anyway, other things that are happening, like in the real world, although in comic book fashion, for instance, uh, let's see, uh, elections in Brazil, which I didn't mention to you the other day, but, um, well, that's, that's happening and they have a weird election system. And I think you got to have a, you know, uh, 50% plus take of the vote. And I don't know how they count those things in Brazil. Um, in order to avoid a runoff, and if there's a runoff, I don't know. The same two guys basically run against each other again. Bolsonaro running for re-election um, and uh, declared ahead of time in very Trumpian fashion, and this is something to, to keep an eye on, declared ahead of time that not only, of course, was the election possibly going to be rigged against him, so that you know, he knows he's the most popular guy. And if you see that he doesn't, quote unquote, win the election, that it has been rigged. But he threw in this the extra uh, conspiratorial note that uh, the deep state actors, and in this case, the deep Brazilian state actors who have rigged the election, have figured out how to do it without leaving a trace. They uh, have a new... Uh, awesome computer system that leaves no evidence behind whatsoever. He just either he wins, in which case they failed to rig the election, or he loses, in which case they rigged the election, but did it in with supercomputers that leave no footprints and fingerprints behind. So you'll never be able to prove that that's the case. But I'm telling you ahead of time that it's true. So therefore... So there you have it. And, uh, they're having that, uh, they're, they're running that race now, counting the votes. Um, and things were close and the other guy, Lula, was ahead. And I don't know anything about, uh, Brazilian politics except that Bolsonaro is doing these crazy Trumpian things. But besides that, I mean, I guess we're crossing our fingers for anybody but the Trumpy guy to win. But what do I know? Uh, I'm not Brazilian and I don't mean to wish anything on you Brazilians that you don't want. But uh, I hope you get what you want because the other guy is setting it up so that you get him no matter what. So anyway, Greg Dworkin is here. He's probably figured this stuff out a little bit or at least found articles to read that will make us sound like we know what's going on. Uh, I like caipirinhas. They're nice drinks. Brazilian people seem pretty cool. Other than that, hey, man, soccer, and I hope you get a good president. So yes, good morning, and, Greg. Uh, you know, the Bossa Nova and uh, okay. the girl from Ipanema and right, right. That one, one of the most from the beautiful, beautiful languages in the entire world. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I like some songs that are done in it. And I've heard them on the radio and they're pretty cool. Uh, Portuguese comes out real nice. Uh, you think you're hearing Spanish, but it's not. And we have an enormous uh, Brazilian uh, contingency here in the Danbury area. Do you? All right. And a smaller uh, Portuguese uh, contingency as well. The mm. history there is that uh, we made hats. Oh, yes. So well, uh, hats were uh, needed <laughs> needed felt. And so the felt makers uh, uh, and the craftsmen came from Portugal. Hmm. And so there was a very large Portuguese-speaking population, relatively that. speaking, in the area which also attracted, uh, in later years, uh, Brazilians. Okay. No, the Brazilians and the Portuguese don't always get totally along, but, you know, they, they mostly do. Colonialism. Yeah. And uh, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of Portuguese spoken around here. So these elections, cool. as well as, uh, by the way, soccer, pizza. football, are, yeah. are followed fairly well. Okay. Fairly closely here. No wonder. Okay. Well, that's excellent. A uh, bit of history. Apparently, my hometown is what used to be big in hats as well in the early... 20th century. Uh, for some reason, the, I guess two hat manufacturing centers. And then, and now, now here we are. Two former hat kingpins, I guess. Not really. But 
Yeah, interesting thing. I, like I said, I saw a Mystic Pizza. I know there's Portuguese speaking populations somewhere in Connecticut. Absolutely. That's, so, so uh, you that's know, the, reality, the, obviously, uh, the vote me. there is between Lula and Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro yeah. is uh, certainly authoritarian in nature and threatened to uh, claim that the entire election was rigged if he lost. And what happened is that in the early polling, which wasn't really a miss, it looks like it, but it really wasn't, uh, Lula, his opponent, who had previously served and was associated with scandals, and yes. so, you know, it was, was corruption impeached. versus authoritarianism, uh, was, uh, Lula was uh, projected to win close to 50%. And he did. He got 47% in the first round. Mm -hmm. okay. And Bolsonaro was predicted to get somewhere around 35, 38 percent. And he got 42. What happened mm. is that he consolidated a lot of the vote that was going to minor candidates who now have to mm. drop out for the yes, next okay. round. All right. And that so makes sense. the polls didn't really miss that much. They, they looked weird because you have to appreciate the fact that there were all these other candidates who now don't exist. And Lula actually hit his mark. So the next round right. is uh, Bolsonaro versus Lula, and uh, that's what's going on there. And so uh, Bolsonaro changed from the Trumpian, if I lose, it's rigged, to the pollsters are stupid and they don't know anything. Yeah. Oh, OK. Which, by the way, is a fairly American thing to say by all parties. Well, you know, that is our major export right now. Yeah. Stupid polls. Right. So um, – Speaking of which, so uh, bringing this uh, back a little bit uh, to the United States. But before I do that, uh, one other piece of international news. Well, there's several. Uh, maybe we should do the international stuff first. In uh, merry old England, mm -hmm. as you know, we talked about the fact that uh, Liz Truss became the new prime minister. And she was uh, pretty much a, a Thatcherite and not particularly um, engaging when it comes to interviews. Oh. So she suggested this big, big, big tax cut for the rich to fix the British economy, which wasn't really part of her manifesto when she won the uh, uh, inter-party duel mm -hmm. and became the prime minister when Boris Johnson had to step down. And so she and her uh, chancellor of the exchequer pushed this rate cut which roiled the markets because it wasn't paid for. Everybody got upset. Bank of England had to intervene. That was last week. Okay. And then she gave a round of interviews uh, trying to explain it, and that went poorly. So then she gave another round of interviews, which were embargoed hmm. until okay. after this morning when she reversed course and said, okay, those rate heights aren't going to happen. And are, as uh, as Reuters puts it, uh, in humiliating fashion, she had to uh, make a U-turn. Okay. All right. So uh, how did they say? British Prime Minister Liz Truss was forced into a humiliating U-turn after less than a month in power, reversing a cut to the highest rate of income tax that helped spark turmoil in financial markets and a rebellion in her party. In fact, some of her strongest backers mm -hmm. were saying things like uh, – Widespread dismay at the fact that three years of work has effectively been put on hold. Nobody asked for this. Hmm. Uh, all this stuff we were planning on doing, signed off by the cabinet, all ready to go, all stopped. If Liz wants a whole new mandate, she must take to the country. In other words, call an election if you want to do this sort of thing. I see. They just had one. Or, I mean, well, they've been uh, through well, a, a, but they're scheduled a to have process. The, but, yeah. uh, this wasn't an election for the country. Of course, right, this right. was just an election for the Tories because they stay in power. And they're obligated to do a national election at latest January 2025, although everybody thinks it's going to be sooner. And this particular person is saying, hey, if you want to do that, call for a snap election now, you sure. moron. Do all the snaps. Do all the snaps, because what you're doing is like Oh, you moron. Us. So yeah, uh, me, she yes. looks terrible. Uh, and the point is that uh, telling the story about the embargoed uh, interviews Hmm. Is that in all of these interviews, which were done before she made the U-turn decision, but released after she made the U-turn decision, you no. know, at least one uh, interviewer said, so is there any possible chance you'll change your <laughs> mind? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not great. Uh, so not good she PR. told the truth and then she told the truth, hmm. which is they weren't working and Thatcherism and Reaganism 
uh, Reaganomics doesn't work because the market well, say so. I'm glad they found that out. But well, well they found out they the hard way. So really interesting to see what happens now. All right. So she's in big trouble politically, and she's only been there a month. Yes, it's not been a good one. So, you know, that needed to be uh, commented on. And, of course, the other big international stories was going on in Ukraine. Not only did the Ukrainians take Lyman, uh, they're now threatening uh, Kherson with uh, stories about them breaking through there as well. Russia is really running out of military uh, things to do. And this comes after uh, yes. Putin announced that he had next these places and they will be Russia forever, except for the fact that they no longer are, at least Lyman isn't. Mm, right. Well, it's a, he was forced to make a U-turn. Uh, so what happens next? Well, you know, the Ukrainians are saying, well, eventually Crimea, too. Why not? So, uh, you know, the war is not going well for Putin. And uh, we'll see what happens from that point. Yes. All right. Staying tuned. Uh, Lula was not impeached. I was thinking of another former president who was No, impeached. he was associated with scandals, but he yes. wasn't impeached. Right. Okay. Just correcting that record. So, okay. I mean, we're all watching Brazil very closely. Hmm. Right. So, uh, you know, very <laughs> yeah, interesting. Sure. So the polls in England yes. uh, say that uh, uh, the Tories are going to get hammered hmm. the next election. I mean, okay. they have a... a 33 point lead for labor with the scale of the uh, rise in labor just like going straight up vertically. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, which corresponds, of course, with uh, job. the conservatives dropping in a right. straight line. And so uh, a lot of this is going to be forced. In the US, uh, the talk over the weekend is a whole new round of polls, which basically highlight the fact that this is a tight election. We've moved away from red wave, not going to happen. Then right. we were talking about the fact that, well, you know, blue wave with uh, abortion and, and pink wave and purple wave and whatever you want to call it, because we haven't decided what to call this year's soccer moms. Mm. Right. And uh, so now a new round of polls says, well, wait a minute. What's happening is that there's a really close election and we really don't know who's going to win. Therefore, let's talk about how well the Republicans are doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the round of thing. Everybody gets the same newsletters I get. And so, oh, well, they're, you know, doing things on crime in Pennsylvania and Fetterman's lead has evaporated and they're doing things in crime in Wisconsin and Barnes's lead has evaporated. Although I see this morning Barnes is unleashing his abortion ads, which I don't know why they weren't running until now, but now they are. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is uh, we we note that uh, Georgia mm -hmm. and Wisconsin. And uh, now. Pennsylvania yes. and Nevada no. right. are the close elections that we really don't know who's going to win. The stories in Nevada are that mm -hmm. when you interview uh, Latinos, Hispanics, they say they're never going to vote for Republicans, but they might stay home. All right. And so well, I mean, not right, uh, Al, uh, I Adam you. Laxalt is ahead in, in by a point in a couple of polls, which obviously means landslide for Republicans. And we're back to talking about red wave again. Mm, OK, great. Yeah, don't right. So happen. so uh, I just thought this was interesting. Mark Melman, of all people, pollster in The Hill, mm -hmm. has a piece called The Likely Voter Sham. OK, Sham. Uh, which, by the way, that's a term, you know, shamixation. That's the the thing that uh, Putin did with. Uh, <laughs> All right, you know it's Short been used before in uh, other countries in other ways, but uh, certainly fits there. New York Times data journalist extraordinaire Nate Cohen, otherwise known as the other Nate, used Twitter last week to announce the Times was switching to likely voters. That's that is their polls would now reflect the opinion of voters likely to turn out in November, and the Times is hardly alone. So it's a propitious moment to trot out one of my favorite polling iconoclasms. Focusing on likely voters can be misleading and, in fact, a misleading sham. Mm -hmm. First plus, this may sound foolish. Aren't we just interested in those who do? And the answer is, uh, even though non-voters play no role in elections, my, Mark Melman's argument rests on two central premises. First, the methods for determining who's a likely voter aren't very effective. Okay. And second... We aren't really interested in likely voters. We want to know the likely electorate. And to make a long story short, likely voters are people who vote a lot. 
or who say they're going to vote, except that they lie to pollsters and they don't always show up. So, you know, 88 percent of the time when you say I'm absolutely going to vote, you vote. Well, what does that mm-hmm. tell you? We want to know who's actually going to show up. And if you're an unlikely voter, but you show up, you're more important than a likely voter who doesn't. Well, sure. You're and that's why a likely electorate voter. is a better term for this. And then he gives the example of Harry Reid, who was losing an election in Nevada and Melman was the pollster. And if you went by a likely voter scale, Harry Reid loses. But the unlikely voters favored him by 30 points. And so when some of those showed up, it turned out he won. And mm-hmm. that's how you pull out close elections. The point I'm making is that all of these elections, Nevada, Wisconsin, Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania, they're all close. All right. So polling telling you that the Republicans are ahead because likely voter screen doesn't mean squat. Okay. We don't know who's going to win. It's too close to call. And the question, of course, is who actually shows up. And then as you get closer, and we are getting closer, I mean, you know, there's there's uh, five weeks. But as you get to two weeks or one week, then you get to the, oh, well, you know, forget about the polls. It's all a question of turnouts. It, it is now. We can skip that month of nonsense. Hmm. And just try to figure out what's going on. That's why Mandela Barnes deciding to run abortion ads for the first time uh, is important. Again, why he wasn't doing this, why all these folks weren't being hammered beforehand, why Ron Johnson wasn't being defined as the uh, no good Nick apparatchik uh, Russian tool that he is. You know, Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we were ready to hear it. So. Uh, we're ready to hear it now. So, you know, well, you got to be aggressive early voting about this. And, you know, negative ads, in fact, do work. Uh, but you have to run positive ads as well. The problem is Johnson has nothing positive, so it's all negative. Mm. Uh, same thing with Oz. And so, you know, what you'll do is you'll cut the gap and you'll talk reluctant Republicans into coming off the fence. Things are always narrow as you get closer to Election Day. That's what that really means. But mm-hmm. are they likely voters or unlikely vote? We don't know. And so, you know, that's the background to all of this. And so it can be depressing. And if you're a Democrat who was hoping that a wave would be building in your favor and then you see this, uh, you know, uh, plethora of stories about people staying home because it's the midterms Hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, that Republicans are catching up because of ads on crime. Well, again, we don't know. We don't know what the younger voters who they're not asking are going to do. We don't know about uh, new uh, registrants who can't, by a, any definition, fit likely voter screens. Yes, right. How can you be a likely voter when you just registered two months ago? Yeah, pretty unlikely, really, honestly. You might so that's where again. the unlikely voters come in. So uh, there's no reason to despair. There's no reason to assume that we win. It's a close election. Nobody knows. That's going to be true until Election Day. Hmm. And okay. that, you know, well. so uh, do the polls... Uh, fail? No, they're all telling us it's really close. Yeah, Read them in terms us. of what they're telling you. They're not telling you who's going to win. No. Oh, well, then who cares? Well, yeah. But, right, you know, you want to know if it's close right. or not close. Michigan governor, not right. close. If you had Good. a snap election today in the UK, uh, labor leads the Tories by 33 points. Not close. Right. It doesn't mean that they will win because the election isn't for who knows. Yeah, it's not up to them. Well, you know, that's a that's an extreme example, but uh, drives home the point that just because you're winning today doesn't mean you win the election, especially when you don't even know when the election is. <laughs> yes. That, and the that way Liz Truss is doing, you don't even know who's going to be running. Hmm. Right. True. That's another thing. I mean, I guess so, it could change. Uh, you know, don't don't take the polls to the bank in terms of they tell you what's going to happen, but they are telling you what's going on right now. And right now it's too close to call, okay. which is great, because remember, two months ago, we were talking about red waves. Right. So even though uh, we're no longer talking about, oh, my gosh, it could go in the, to the extremes in the other direction. Uh, it, it isn't where it was. That's progress. That's fine. These things happen. Uh, yeah, we can't speed up the election, but it is early voting in a lot of states, and that may that may even make it more difficult to figure out who likely voters are. Because uh, you've got to, there's a month and a half you could be voting in. I don't know whether they're yeah. I mean, it's even not. too early early for yard signs. So you know, right? How do you really know? You, well, then you that's what tells you who's going to win. Mm-hmm. So I say wait for that. But now people aren't doing it for whatever reason. Okay. So what else is going on? Mm, uh, there's a pressure building on France and Germany. 
nice. uh, to uh, get on board and start uh, arming Ukraine. The problem is that those mm. countries don't really have militaries that are capable of doing it, and that's why the U.S. is doing the lion's share of work in that regard. However, for those who criticize Europe, you have to remember they're giving non-military aid. In fact, the non-military aid from the EU is more than the U.S. is giving. All right. So By a little like bit. So Lollipops they're doing their part. They're just doing it in different Licorice and ways. such. Okay. I, I imagine that's cash? Yeah. Well, you know, cash, humanitarian, financial. Toothpaste. Yeah, I don't know. In dollars. Yeah. Oh. Can't give it in rubles. Well, yeah, that would be unwise. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it does appear, by the way, that the Nord Stream uh, leak has been cut. So uh, yeah, it's not nice. leaking methane anymore, which is good because methane is bad. Right. For the environment. And speaking of the environment and climate, and you know, don't forget, we're still trying to uh, dig our way out of what's going on in Florida. Still a big story, going to be a huge financial mm. mess. Oh, yeah. Uh, people can't get insured. You can't get flood insurance in some uh, of those places. What? Isn't that weird? Why? Yeah, I can't believe it. And, a lot uh, more to talk about after the break on true. that. But, you know, again, we're only people now getting the extent of what's going on. There's at least, uh, you know, a half a half a hundred deaths or so. Uh, Lee yeah, County didn't yeah. evacuate when they were told to evacuate. We're still trying to figure out why Yeah, and more to come. Yeah. Well, there is an awful lot. And uh, yeah, more people than usual died probably as a result. And I don't really know why they didn't. I, like, I guess just uh, who knows? I don't know who was in charge of Lee County. Uh, the governor wasn't particularly forceful until kind of after the fact, insisting, I told you all to get out of here, but nah, not really, not at the time. Talk all about right. it after the break. Yeah, well, that and many other things, uh, lots still happening here, and uh, okay, I don't know, there's nothing else we can fit in here. I just have to talk until the break comes, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? That's why it's your show. Yeah, right, it's my job. Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And, of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Now we have, you know, a block of time that we can use to uh, discuss things. It's not 10 seconds. We don't have to just stand around counting down anymore. Great. What's up? I don't know. So uh, I'm reading this story from the New York Times. And, yes. Uh, there's similar things in the uh, Florida papers. Uh -huh. As Hurricane Ian charged toward the western coast of Florida this week, the warnings from forecasters were growing more urgent. Life-threatening storm surge threatened to deluge the region from Tampa all the way to Fort Myers, which we knew. And then uh, we were yeah. all following the turn that the hurricane took and didn't hit Tampa, which would have been even a bigger disaster uh, mm -hmm. because of the bay. Uh, but while officials along much of that coastline responded with orders to evacuate on Monday, emergency managers in Lee County held off pondering during the day whether to tell people to flee, but then deciding to see how the forecast evolved overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I had some contact with some of the Daily Coast uh, commenters in the Pundit Roundup. We said we were down there and we base we're on vacation and in that area. And we basically ignored what the officials were saying and the people in our hotel were saying. We looked at the weather channel and we got the hell out of Dodge. So, yeah, the data was there. Turn on the TV and you can see it's not. Of course, it's different if you're there on vacation versus living there. Right. So the delay, says home. the story, an apparent violation of the meticulous evacuation strategy the county had crafted for just such an emergency oh, may no. have contributed to catastrophic consequences that are still coming into focus as the death toll continues to climb. Sounds this like is Lee pandemic. County. You wonder whether they hired all the people from Uvalde to run their emergency management. Yeah, they all waited in the and, hallway. And, and the bigger point there is that you can 
say government should be smaller and government sucks and government doesn't any ever do anything and government mm. is always in the you need them and you're not there for them boy does it show yeah this is not fun and games this is like real and that's what government's role is and yes there's a role and yes it, it could be uh, fulfilled better and uh, they screwed up dozens yeah. have died overall mm -hmm. in the state officials said i think most of them right now are out of lee county uh, ian downgraded to a post-tropical cyclone was moving through north carolina and virginia on saturday i don't know if we got anywhere near you virginia mm, beach got rain hit some us. flooding yeah uh, it wasn't uh, we were not in the direct line by any means and we just got some uh, wind up here, and that's about it. About 35 of Florida storm-related deaths have been identified in Lee County, highest toll anywhere in the state. As survivors ample, described yeah. the sudden surge of water predicted as a possibility before the storm hit that sent some of them scrambling for safety in attics and on rooftops. You go up to the attic, and you can't get out, and the water right. comes up. You're not going to do well. Yes, that's a real concern. You get trapped in there unless you have some sort of... Uh, they were saying, bring an axe with you. Like, you can chop through the roof. Wow. Lee County, which includes the hard-hit seaside community of Fort Myers, as well as the towns of Fort Myers, uh, Fort Myers Beach, as well as towns of Fort Myers, Sanibel, and Cape Coral, did not issue a mandatory evacuation order mm. for the areas likely to be hard to sit until Tuesday morning, a day after neighboring counties had ordered their most vulnerable residents to flee. And by then... Some residents recalled they had little time to evacuate. Yeah, you can't get gas, you can't get plywood to board your windows up, nothing. Right. Uh, and uh, let's see. DeSantis and his state emergency management traffic. director said the earlier forecast that predicted the brunt of the storm's fury would strike further north. So basically, um, he's uh, blaming everybody but him and uh, whoever's in charge in Lee County. That sounds about right. You know, there must be Republicans or something. In right. All the other counties would have blamed them. Yeah. And they got out of Dodge. Mm. And Lee County's emergency planning documents that set out a time is of the essence strategy. That's why you <laughs> do these things. Remember, Florida has lots of experience with this. They know Supposedly. what to do. They didn't do it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, leadership changes. They have, they probably have no experience with it, but that's why you leave the book behind. But remember what happened with the book that got left behind for the pandemic? They don't trust books. They burn them. So, right. oh, well. Well, speaking of which, the, Mr. Royan, the county commissioner, said one challenge the county faced was the local schools who had been designated hmm. to be shelters. Well, the school board decided to keep them open on Monday. Oh, well, so... He well, I mean, that's it's good they're open, but then you can't get in at a shelter there because there's kids there. And as you know, there's only one door so, for safety. No coordination there. Uh, uh, so yeah. big problems. Mm. And uh, I think there's a lot more uh, to come on that. So I think definitely worth uh, mentioning because uh, mm. those decisions uh, cost lives. Yes. And I don't know. Yeah, they all think they're never going to be held accountable for these things. Maybe uh, and another thing Maybe that uh, DeSantis assumed he would never be held accountable for, the notorious Perla has been identified by the uh, New York Times. Yeah. person being looked at in connection with the operation is a woman named Perla Huerta, former combat medic and counter intel agent who was discharged last month after two decades in the U.S. Army. Huh. Uh, and again, horrible stuff coming out. Staff members at the community center in Martha's Vineyard arranged for a migrant named Pablo to call home to Venezuela. He appeared broken. My love, we were tricked, he told his wife, weeping uncontrollably. This woman lied to us. She lied. So there they were, stuck on an island, no way to get off. And, uh, you know, uh, lawsuits are, are coming. I mean, not just theoretically, actual yes. lawsuits are well, coming. Well, this, yeah, this is uh, it's, it's how it ought to be handled. I mean, besides just tossing... Uh, DeSantis in jail, but hey, we don't do that in this country, so we'll handle it in a different fashion. But yeah, uh, I was wondering about that too. Uh, I mean, to go from that crisis to uh, to the hurricane and now back to this, uh, there's no, well, good. There should be no respite for him. And I, watching all the people sitting in the evacuation traffic trying to get out, I was thinking, I have a lot of a lot of them would have liked to have a free charter flight to Martha's Vineyard. I wonder if the governor is planning on arranging any of that to help any Floridians. Or no, okay, only only Venezuelan migrants get that. Well, kind I of think he'll think twice on sending anybody to Lawyer Island anymore. 
Yeah, well, send people somewhere. They all needed help, and you blew all the money on a stunt, and it's not going well. Uh, so a fellow named Mark Green on Twitter says, the Republican Party's dominance-based authoritarianism is fueled by alpha displays of economic, political, and physical violence inside and outside the party. Well, this is of interest because what world. happens next with DeSantis when he has to distract Everyone must be kept off balance, distrustful in competition for what limited security exists. The cruelty is the point. And how will the GOP extremist authoritarian culture play out in future legislation, tax policy, women's rights, immigration? In a dominance based political culture, leaders vie for power by one upping each other's display of dominance. You pass a law for uh, outlawing abortion, I'll pass a law putting mm-hmm. a $10,000 bounty on right, women who right. seek one. This need to okay. escalate displays of dominance is why the downward spiral of authoritarianism accelerates as it takes hold. And we're seeing that spiral now in the GOP. And that's why various Republican leaders are signaling the end of marriage equality, Social Security, Affordable Care Act, et cetera, et cetera. And why Lindsey Graham prematurely signaled the national abortion ban. He's hmm. frantic to signal his dominance by attacking women. So uh, I say all of that because if that's true then watch DeSantis and see what he does next. Because a lot of the stuff he's doing has been exposed. He's uh, in a uh, a dueling uh, situation with the governor of Texas to see who can be more cruel. And yeah, know uh, you know, we'll see whether or not the actual thing. hurricane and the need to actually tend to his constituents hmm. changes that spiral a little. Yeah, well, there was talk that it was at least distracting him and making him uh, behave and uh, pretend that he was concerned with Floridians for a while. Yeah, he was forced to say nice things about Joe Biden. So how does oh. that happen? <laughs> okay, well, that's fun. That will uh, reverberate for a little while. I was wondering why... It ruined Chris habit. Christie's career. Yeah, oh, that's true. It, it was really primed to be ruined, of course. Uh, but, well, but nobody knew that at the time. Yeah. Everybody thought it was a good move because he was nice to Obama. And then when it came to actually run in 2016, uh-uh. Well, that you were nice to a Democrat. Not that, you were nice to it. a black Democrat. Uh-uh. Uh, uh, you oh, are well, not that's, getting elected. Yeah, that's a difference. That's a thing that people like to point to and, you know, uh, as a, as a Yeah, but, but now to... we're talking, it's, uh, you know, some years later, and now we're talking about Dark Brandon. Yeah. You can't right. be nice to Dark Brandon. Uh, that's true. And it is. That's heresy. That's that's worse than comic books. <laughs> that's true. Now it explains that's everything. That's consorting with the devil. I guess so. Yeah, this we will be very interesting to like, see how uh, it works. Red dark rays come out of his eyes like yeah. uh, like Cyclops in the X-Men. I proved my point. It's all satanic. Right. Red backgrounds that just like hell, as they say. Yeah, um, yeah it'll be interesting to because see how Because to announce that Dark with... Brandon was coming, uh, Cyclops what? and the X-Men were a thing for a <laughs> long time. And that was just to set you up so that when the devil in the form of Dark Brandon got here, you'd be all ready for it. Right. So the way is prepared. The way is prepared. The The choice is made. The traveler has come. Right. Um, you know, uh, the, hmm. the Comics Code Authority is kind of an interesting uh, side discussion in and of itself. This voluntary is thing it? existed from Let's the see. 50s. Yeah. So the comics wouldn't be censored by the government. And some comics didn't go along with it. A lot did. I can remember when I was a little kid and I liked to read Marvel comics, you know, the devil mm-hmm. stuff, Doctor Strange and stuff like that. Yes. well, And when they cost 12 them. cents <laughs> when I was a kid. I remember when they went up satanic. from 10 cents to 12 cents. Oh. And uh, my dad was unhappy with me spending so much money on comics and so he laid down the law and said, you can't buy comics unless they have a comic code authority on it. And I looked at my <laughs> comics and they said, they all have them. Oh, all right. So you and were he said, oh, shape. and that was the last thing he ever said about right. comics. So it was moral, judged moral to uh, raise your prices. Something so. like that. Huh. Well, okay. You know, I mean, but, you uh, know, kids uh, today. The true you know? devil incarnate, of course, is Dark Brandon and Democrats because we know that because all the yeah. preachers tell us that. So and so, Christy you know, DeSantis uh, actually being good acting Obama. as a grown-up puts him in a real bind. I, I mean, hope it works that How does he play way. to his base when you do that? Because you can't do both at the same time. Hmm. And it was, uh, if I'm not 
do I remember correctly? I mean, was he nice to Obama because of aid for Christy? Sandy? Of Sandy. Yeah. And so, because DeSantis was just in the news about that. Apparently one of his, like his first vote when he was in Congress was to, you know, vote against Sandy aid. Yeah. When he was a congressman. Yeah. And now, of course, he's uh, supposedly responsible for Florida. Oh, please give us aid. And, but he's playing the same game that Christie did. I wonder if there's comments on the record made. I don't know. DeSantis wasn't quite a national player yet. Marco Rubio had comments and he was interviewed about it. Yeah. He uh, voted against it. And he was asked sure. why. And he said, well, it was a lot of waste and pork. Somebody yeah. wanted to fix a roof. And Dana Bash said to him, but I went through the record and that roof was damaged by Sandy. And that's why they were going to. Yeah. And he, well, of course, he changed his roof for. Well, yes. So that's just your straight gimme it's But it's, uh, it's interesting that. Uh, yeah, money so for much me, but not for thee. Sandy has such an impact on on. On the same, Cause, all the cause it was New York wants. values. You yeah. know, it, had it right. hit San Francisco, it would have been the same sort of thing. Yeah. You can't give money to those people. You got to give it to me. And you I got to give it. it to me. So, and, all right. And who it's is explainable. the epicenter of those people? New York. Yeah, pretty much. I guess that's it. So, well, so we'll see whether the same damage is incurred by DeSantis. I'd love for it to be the case, but uh, yeah, it's hard to predict how this goes now. I, I Christie. I don't think was ready with the PR machine that uh, DeSantis has and hadn't fully embraced just total. It doesn't matter what the facts say. Give me Tarianism yet. Mm -hmm. So, well, we'll see how DeSantis comes through with it. Uh, I hope, uh, I don't know. He's crushed under the weight, but we'll see. Uh, so uh, on a happier note, hmm. uh, yes, remember well, pro fish wins elections. Yes. Yes. In Alaska. Okay. So there's a new Alaska poll out and uh they're really getting into this whole thing about uh uh, uh runoff voting uh -huh, okay. new alaska new poll results from alaska survey oh, research 12 1282 likely general election voters whatever likely, likely voter is wins Fish. for mary peltola u.s congress lisa murkowski u.s senate mike dunleavy alaska governor in round one, Mary Peltola gets 48.7, Sarah Palin 23.3, Nick Begich 25.6. So remember, Palin came in second last time, but uh, Begich now comes in second and Palin third. She's oh. fading. Chris Bai at 2.4 is eliminated. Mm -hmm. So in the next round, remember, the one who loses is eliminated and their votes are reallocated. Right. Mary Peltola, 49.7. Sarah Palin, 23.9. Nick Begich, 26.3. Right. So Peltola doesn't quite get 50 in the second round, according to this poll. And remember what happens to the losing person out of the three. They get eliminated. All that right. would be Sarah Palin. Mm -hmm. And in the okay. final round, Mary Peltola, 54.3. Nick Begich, 45.7. Peltola hmm. wins. All right. And the survey uh, pollster says, when I tweeted a few months back that Mary Peltola was the real deal and has the tools to appeal beyond the traditional 40 percent Alaska Democrat base. I wasn't kidding. Who says She's this? categorically the most popular figure in Alaska right now. Wow. That's because she's pro fish. I'm telling you, fish I mean, matter there. It's all about the salmon. It's all fish about are like Bristol voters Bay in that state. and pebble mine uh, uh, pollution and trying right. to stop it. Uh, Nicholas Begich isn't going anywhere. The recent Fabrizio poll for the AARP showed Begich dropping off the pace in third, but he's all over this poll. If anything, it's Palin who's flagging. Her negatives are 66%. Mm. Wow. Right? And Begich yes. does well, well except her. until he runs into Mary Peltola, who so, for him is a brick wall. There's yeah, a new game in town. And she's popular. He's not. I hope so. I mean... That, that sounds like I was a little worried about the the a final matchup between the two of them as opposed to Sarah Palin, who yeah, everybody's she got went either way. on. Uh, that's great. I so wasn't that's sure that would be news. the case. I mean, and I guess we're still not really sure that it will be the case. but Of course, because it's a poll. I mean, yeah. We already talked about polls, but right. nonetheless, and it's fish. encouraging. And then uh, U.S. Senate round one, Lisa Murkowski gets 41. Kelly Shabaka gets 38.6. Very likes Trumpy fish. alternative. Patricia Chesbro gets 16, and Buzz Kelly, right out of uh, Toy Story, gets uh, 4.2. Buzz Kelly. For, okay. 
Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the season, the second season writers really need to review this. <laughs> you don't want people running named Buzz Kelly, Blake Masters. <laughs> That's fake. You know. Come on. Yeah. Tudor Dixon. Biff Manley. <laughs> <laughs> Howitzer Explosion Guy. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, All right. I, round two. Lisa Murkowski, 42. Kelly Toshiba, 40.6. Patricia Chesbro, 17. And you know what happens to the person trailing. They get They fish. get eliminated. Eliminated. That's Long right. Fish. Final round, Lisa Murkowski, 56. Kelly Toshiba, 43. Not really close. The fish not making a difference there. That Peltola Murkowski symbiosis is strong, despite the fact they're in different parties. People who are positive to Peltola are 71% positive to Murkowski. Hmm. People who are positive to Murkowski are 85% positive to Peltola. Okay. The pro fish candidate is a new force in Alaskan politics. And Shabaka doesn't have the legs to win. She doesn't have the Shibaka. appeal to cross the partisan divide, particularly in comparison to Peltola. Among the 38% of the population who describe themselves as politically moderate, Peltola's positive negative is 60 to 14, and Shabaka's is 17 to 54. Oh, uh, why? I don't know. Just is. Uh, because she's a Trumpy, nasty person. Oh, okay. And Peltola's just like the nicest person in the world. And mm -hmm. Alaska's small. You have to remember, Alaska has not got a huge population. People know you. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, you know, it's... It's really hard. Like, how are you going to run negative ads against Mary Peltola when everybody knows her? I, I, right it doesn't now, work. I would just say you just do. But and you I mean, do, you can. You can. Burn, hopefully, take. right? Nah, you you know, just burn his right money. Now, that's not true. All right. Well, in that case, run them all. I mean, burn the money. Right. I think that uh, you know the Republican Party should spend all their money there instead of trying to spend it on uh, Ohio judges. Mm, right. Which well, they are. They're dumping yeah. money there. And of course, right. they're dumping money on JD Vance. Well, everything gets dumped on J.D. Vance, but all right. Because well, yeah. he's a dumpster. Yeah. Uh, they should un advertise underwater to these fish that are yeah, so important. Yeah, they should. Uh, you know, and an uh, I don't know how you do yard signs underwater, but you got to do it. Hmm, I'm thinking about this. Yeah, all, all right. right. Well, I'll come up with a well, laminated, I guess. So uh, let's see what else we have in the news here. Uh, interesting changes happening, right, Phillips O'Brien, in European discourse about helping Ukraine. Months ago, there was the old canard about when will Europe lose interest, and now it's the language, uh, don't be left behind. <laughs> it's going to give what, when, because mm. everybody loves Get on the ground floor in Ukraine. Yeah, I guess that's a possibility. I understand that the Ukraine was thinking of going ahead with an, a NATO application now, and I, I, I wonder whether they're – uh, well, you need all 30 uh, countries to say yes. Yeah. They've already got a bunch lined up, but, you know, what's Hungary going to do? Uh, I don't what's know. Turkey going to do? It's hmm. a good question. Until you know them, it's not going anywhere. Right. I, I was thinking, oh, not really a great thing. That's Why don't we matters. just win this war first and then we'll Well, yeah, talk well, about you it. win and you go, okay, fine. Yeah. And I don't know if I mentioned it on the show, but people have, uh, I, I forget what I said on uh, Thursday because I, like, I forget did. what I said 10 minutes ago. But uh, people saying? have noted that uh, the NATO countries, uh, and I think we did talk about it in terms of fallout, uh, you can't use a nuclear weapon because even if you blow it up in Ukraine, which isn't a NATO country, if the fallout comes our way, we consider uh -huh. that uh, you know, significant. Yes. That counts. I mean, right. What to do about it? Uh, when the you know the options include other, more nuclear weapons, well, we haven't used nu tactical nuclear weapons in a NATO country. Well, we got your fallout, so we're yeah. going to take that into account when we decide what to do. Yeah, uh, we'll have super sanctions against you. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, doubtful to me, and and it's a good with good reason. It's doubtful that we would see escalation into nuclear retaliation. It should be a last. Resort it shouldn't even be a resort, really. But uh, all right, well, we'll we'll see, I guess. But uh, I, I thought that was kind of weird, and I was hoping they would put that behind them for now and not entangle themselves in a NATO bid until the war was won. And I don't know. I guess they they figured it was. I guess that's good pressure, and I, I suppose maybe they're thinking they'll never let us in, but they might have NATO members who feel like they should give us more aid and consolation. For not letting us in, maybe that's the play. I mm -hmm. don't know. It seems like a bad idea at the moment, but because this that would give the Russians a 
the PR victory, they were all, this whole invasion was about, well, they're going to join NATO and westernize and then be against us, so we have to do this. And then they go and do it. But then who could blame them for going and doing it? Uh, the point of joining NATO is to protect you from Russian invasion, which was always just a theoretical worry until now. So, I don't know. I could see it on both sides here, which I, I, we're going to end up having to both sides Ukraine. That's sad news. Uh, this just I in. would ask them to wait. Yes. The Supreme Court did something reasonably good. Oh, already? They yeah. just started. What happened? Well, you know, you heard this thing about bump stocks? Uh, yeah, I mean, bump I stocks are bad and the Trump administration banned them. Yes, not Well, that was challenged bonds, by gun but... rights groups. Hmm. And they okay. wanted to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Okay. And the Supreme Court just said, "No, nah, we're not hearing that." <laughs> well, you made it here, but we're closed. Bye. Bye. Okay, good. All right, so Supreme I guess the court rejects gun rights challenge to bump stocks ban. The Trump administration imposed the ban after the mass shooting in Las Vegas in 2017. Yeah. The decision not to hear the two related cases, a blow for gun rights activists, leaves the ban in place. The conservative majority court issued a major ruling in June that expanded gun rights, although the legal issues in the bump stock cases were different. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I mean, they do a lot of things that are bad, but they did this, and that's good. Okay, yeah, I mean, we'll take that. Uh, you know, the bump stock, uh, well, all right. It's Wait, good enough. They're not done. They're doing oh. more. Well, they have this all... just breaking, and it's so broken that there's not even a story about it yet. Supreme Court rejects My Pillow CEO Mike Lindell's <laughs> appeal in, in the 2020 election lawsuit. Well, I reject his appeal as well. I don't see. I don't that. find he has any appeal. Right. So that's the end of that. And so did the what Supreme Court. And so we're on the same page here this morning. What was he appealing in this one? It was, uh, let's say, well, a I defamation lawsuit defamation. filed by the voting company Dominion. Oh, He's going to oh. take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Send I me see. money. Okay. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah, that was because he was, of course, accusing them of rigging the election. They said, no, we didn't. That's so defamation. The forward. Got it. Okay. So he was seeking to block it. He has no relief it. from the Supreme Court. He'll have to fight it out in court. Hello, Alex Jones. That's still uh. going on here. Yeah, yeah. He's but we know how that goes. Good. Right? In uh, court, you can't lie. It's collapsing. You know? So Lindell would be really... It's interesting because if he's like truly psychotic, hmm. that's not really lying. Okay. Right? Uh, Your Honor, I'm saying all of these things on the grounds that I'm psychotic. <laughs> well, you could try it. Right? It's the 29th Amendment. Oh. I plead the 29th. What the hell is the 29th? The 29th is uh, I'm uh, innocent on the grounds that I'm psychotic. We'll see. Psychotic plays in a lot of places. You know, Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's on the upswing. Um, Like, for instance, all the people who are insisting that there are furries in their schools. I think that qualifies as psychotic, if you ask me. Oh, and by the way, just to uh, remind you. Uh, back in May, uh, the courts threw out Lindell's own defamation suit against Dominion and Smartmatic. So he tried suing them, and that was thrown out. Then yeah. he tried to quash this one, and uh, his quash was thrown out. Okay. And so, so good. you know, Basically, good for the Supreme the right Court for not doing things. See, when the Supreme Court doesn't do things these that days, that seems pretty good. It's a good thing. Although, yeah, well, not always. Sometimes with that shadow docket, that uh, does throw monkey wrench in things. Sometimes that means leaving some bad decisions in place. But this leaves a good decision in place. I mean, basically, it seems unanimous throughout the Article Three federal courts that Mike Lindell is going to have to get sued for defamation by Dominion. And we want to see how that comes out. And nobody wants to stop that. Uh, or allow a countersuit. So great, good. It should. Be. I mean, that's straightforward. It's the way it ought to be, and the way people. Once again, one small part of the law operating the way uh, Americans grew up thinking it would. Good. Mm-hmm. I'm glad for that. Uh, good, and I await the uh, the outcome. Except now we we still haven't had any of the trial <laughs> yet. We're just fighting over whether or not there will be a trial, and now it seems there will be, unless you know. Uh, who knows what what I mean? Psychotics can come up with anything. So uh, I'd be curious, I guess, to see what the next play is. I, I doubt that it's just sit and wait for a trial, but I, 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 I can't imagine what it is yet. But then again, I can't imagine standing in front of a you know a state running for governor and saying kids are pooping in litter boxes. I heard it. It's it's real. 
I, I, you got to believe me. I mean, how do you follow politics? Like, what if you get elected and stuff like that? The rest of the whole state is like, I don't know whether you're making things up or not about anything. You believe that, you'll believe anything. Yep. I am surprised. Anyway, that's that. all I got, but that's okay. Not me. Like I'm talking about litter over. boxes. Yeah, that's true. You made it all the way to the end. I appreciate that. And, uh, okay. Well, uh, oh, and we won't have, we'll have to wait until Thursday for the next update, but we'll be hearing from you via Twitter and everybody will be uh, getting a, a pretty good inkling of what might be coming on Thursday, plus a uh, smattering of good stories that we just won't wait for and we'll blurt and out. Funded on Roundup is on Wednesday, so we'll yeah. have that too. Okay. So you'll have that, just not me telling you. So if you, you can't uh, listen to Kegro in the morning live on Wednesday, you can at least come over to Daily Coast and we'll talk to you on the Pundit Roundup. Right. There's always that. Okay, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. We'll have to figure out where we go next. And now we're we're stuck with another, uh, you know, minute before we. So was any, I'll have to see if I got any minute stories, like minute rice or something like that. Uh, I, maybe I will just follow up with that nonsense story. It occurred to me over the weekend that because I saw that the go, uh, gubern, Republican gubernatorial nominee in Colorado has picked up on the dumb story that we were attributing to Tennessee, although we've seen it everywhere. Uh, it began, I think, in Iowa. It's moved to Tennessee. It's now manifested in Colorado. Once again, Republican candidates for office swearing on a stack of Bibles that they've totally heard from hundreds of people who are definitely telling them the truth about the furry kids in their local high school. Well, I heard a guy who knows a guy who saw another guy at Ferris at 31 Flavors who said that it's really, it's that tenuous. And every time the reporters ask them, well, do you have any proof? Can you give me one example of it actually happening somewhere? And they say things like, there are many, many examples. Well, I know. Can you give me one? There are so many. I guess they just can't fit them all in or something like that. Anyway, some goofball in in uh, Colorado whose name I don't even know. It's just important to know she's she's the actual nominee uh, giving this. And I'm just wondering, like, how you have a press conference. Like, you might as well give a press conference at that point saying, I've solved all our fiscal problems forever. I have bought a bridge in Brooklyn, and everybody knows that this is a real thing. That's as real as the furries. I don't know why anybody doesn't regard it otherwise. All right, welcome back now to the K Go in the Morning Show here on Net Roots Radio. I'm trying to think. I, I don't think there's much more that I can tell you about it. Uh, the the furry situation, except that I guess I should go and hunt. Well, I mean, does it matter? I was going to hunt down the name of the candidate so that we could add that to the record. But if you're in Colorado, I mean, thinking about the listenership of the show, I, I don't even think I have to. Tell, uh, let the listenership of the show know, well, I think you should vote for the Democrat in that one. Uh, you probably know that already. You're probably inclined to do so. And maybe it's of some importance to find out the name of the goofball who's doing it so that they're forever shamed. And if they ever return to politics after losing this gubernatorial election, you'll know and stay away from them. But I, I think they'll make themselves plain in all likelihood but all right let me scroll back down and see there's other bad news out there that uh didn't make it to the uh to pocket but that is in the twitter feed which why not you could certainly occupy yourself with that instead it's not that apparent here we go all right we made it all the way back to here uh all right now we'll know fox 31 the local affiliate there kdvr reporting uh, school district disputes Ganals, is that her name? G-A-N-A-H-L. Ganals claim about students identifying as furries, which again is just not strong enough. I mean, honestly, at this point, the headlines have to be, and I know this goes against all your journalistic incident, uh, instincts, but stupid idiot completely wrong about made up BS lie. That would be a better headline for all this. Um, there's some video rolling here, but I'll, I'll read you that this is like, this is, they treat this seriously, which I think is the big mistake at this point. If you stand up in front of a press conference and give this speech or you're at the hearing or you're gives, giving comments anywhere about the furries and schools and everybody knows it's really true. You should be 
people should just envision you with a boot on your head like Vermin Supreme. This is not a serious adult thing that people who are normal say. It's a very clear signal that there's been a psychotic break for, you know, and if they're the nominee, there's nothing you can do about it. They're stuck with that person on the ballot. This is the sort of thing that sometimes comes out during primaries and in the Republican primary, you find out that one of the people is totally crazy and you avoid that person, you nominate the other one, and then you just say, that's just a regular Republican and we think that they're going to ruin the state through regular policy and avoid them then. But this it's too late. This person's already on the ballot. Republican candidate for governor, Heidi Ganahl is her name, is reiterating a claim. And the reporter who I saw tweeting about this has now said, I don't know if tripling down is really a thing. It isn't, I guess, in the actual, you know, in the actual game. But uh, uh, this for the third time, sticking to her guns about this fake story being totally true. But here we are. Republican candidate for Governor Heidi Ganahl uh, is reiterating a claim that students in Colorado schools are self-identifying as animals, which is probably just never going to be true and also isn't what being a furry is, which is, you know, doubly troubling and all of this. Uh, by the way, the reporter here is Scott Doan, D-O-A-N-E. I don't know if that's who was actually tweeting about it. You know, he was sending around his own story, but uh, I wasn't familiar with the reporter. Somebody else had retweeted it into my timeline somehow. But at any rate, uh, all right. So she's reiterating her claim that students in Colorado schools are self-identifying as animals. It's an assertion that's been disputed by a local district and in fact checks from across the country. I mean, it's just, it's more than that. It's a lie. It's dumb. Anyway, Ganahl took criticism for comments she made during a discussion about Colorado schools on a conservative talk radio show. Not many people know that we have furries in Colorado schools, kids identifying as cats, Ganahl said on the Jimmy Sengenberger show, which is a show, a real thing. And somebody pays for it and everything. And it's on 710 KNUS radio there in Colorado somewhere. Uh, last Saturday, this happened. Of course, it sounds absolutely ridiculous because it is. I mean, I'm, I appreciate that you understand that it sounds ridiculous, but that's it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's happening. But it isn't happening all over Colorado and schools are tolerating. It's insane that it is insane. It's not happening. Not all over Colorado, not in small corners of Colorado. Schools aren't tolerating it. It is insane, but you're the one saying it. That's the insane part. You really need to be able to cut through and see this. Uh, you know, like I said, it is just as it's ju it, everyone would recognize it rhetorically. If you stood up and said, I've solved our fiscal problems, I've made a big investment in New York real estate, I've bought the Brooklyn Bridge, they would say, oh, it's an old trope. Everyone knows that they go around trying to get idiots to believe that the Brooklyn Bridge is for sale and you actually paid money. That's how dumb you are. But here we're like, well, there maybe really are people who are letting their kids pretend that they're cats and poop in litter boxes. I don't know. It's not a known trope yet, except it is a known trope now. It's been months, months already since the real news, you know, emerged. I mean, in case you had to wait for the real news, uh, maybe there are kids doing this. I mean, who knows? Who knows what kids are doing these days? They're eating Tide Pods, for God's sake. Maybe they're pretending they're... And also, there's some possibility, there's some possibility that people who want to believe that there are such situations are saying, I've seen it with my own eyes. And what they've seen with their own eyes is like kids either at Halloween or sometimes not at Halloween. It's, it is becoming a fairly popular thing to like, you know, wear those whack, the, the wacky like cat ear headbands or they sometimes have, uh, you know, headphones attached to them. They're just funny little attachments like the, but I don't remember, uh, well, people were pointing back to nostalgic stuff like the satanic panics of the 1980s. What I don't remember from the 1980s, I do remember the kids wearing those antenna, the bebops, right? They had those springs 
on long springs up on a headband, a plastic headband, and they had little styrofoam balls covered in glitter. They looked like alien antenna, and you would wear them around. I don't remember anybody saying, "There's uh, aliens are abducting our children and replacing them with exact duplicates, except they have antenna. That's the giveaway. I don't know if everybody can see the antenna. It might be like the uh, science fiction movie where only certain people can detect that the aliens have the different characteristics but uh these kids are identifying as aliens no they're just wearing goofy things i you know i don't know what happened to that comedian i really liked steve martin he's identifying as a guy who's been shot through the head with an arrow that's horrible he thinks he's king tut it's unbelievable no it's just a goofy thing that they're wearing what, what's going to happen with halloween with these guys they're all identifying as monsters or possibly superheroes or possibly sexy cats which is even worse because then, yeah, you know, well, anyway, hopefully the kids aren't doing that. But you get the idea. It's an absolutely idiotic thing to believe that's going on. But they might be being fooled by seeing, well, that kid is wearing cat ears. That must be one of those people that's pooping in a litter box. That is a major logical leap, sir. It's just a funny headband. <laughs> it has, there's nothing about it that signals litter box pooping. I love the one in Tennessee, though. So far, my favorite is the one who says some kids are identifying as snakes and pooping litter boxes. But, you know, snakes don't do that. But at any rate, uh, the people were also saying dogs. They're, do they're identifying as cats and dogs and pooping in litter boxes. And by the way, I think a lot of dog owners would say, how, I, how can I get my actual dog to use a litter box? I'd love to know about that. But anyway, these people all over the place and they're standing there and I don't know how it's not obvious that, the you know, this should be a, a rhetorical trope by now that hopefully just by spreading the story and hammering on this idiotic story over and over again, more and more people will come to realize if a politician repeats this story, that should be it forever for that politician. But I mean, how long have we been saying that about Donald Trump? But this should end your career as a thinking adult. And if by some chance this person either wins or, you know, God forbid they should win an election or they just run again and they abandon that story and they just never go back to it again. If they say, well, I have a plan for fixing whatever the state budget. Yeah, well, you thought kids were pooping in litter boxes, so you're out. There's just no way we're going to ever believe anything you have to say. That's just you're just too dumb to be alive. You might need to be hooked up to a respirator. I'm afraid you're going to stop breathing at some point. Anyway, Ganal's comment, just to get back to it, to see if there's anything else equally ridiculous in all of this. Ganal's comments reference the largely, and that's all they say. I'm, I'm mad at the newspapers and the media outlets here too for just not being forceful enough about this. It can't be stressed enough how disqualifying this is. Don't even try to both sides and honestly at this point saying it's been debunked or been fact checked into oblivion or is just not true is not enough there has to be uh, an accounting for how gullible you have to be to buy into this and to stick with it this many months into the hoax but Ganal's comments reference the largely debunked claims that have been made in school districts across the U.S. this year. She defended her comments in an interview airing Sunday on the Channel 2 political program Colorado Point of View, which they should have hit her over the head with a camera. Right on there. Just, I want you to take camera, leave camera one rolling, camera two, take it off of the tripod, smack this idiot over the head until she stops thinking this. That would have been television worth watching. We've got to focus on the basic blocking and tackling of teaching our kids to read, write, and do math and not put up with this nonsense in the classroom. I'm against nonsense, Ganal said. I just heard from over 100 parents identifying 30 different schools that this is happening in. You might want to say, although, then what, are you ending a sentence with a preposition? You will want to say, because we're doing the blocking and tackling of teaching kids to read, write, and do math and not put up with nonsense, you should have said, I just heard from over 100 parents identifying 30 different schools in which this is happening. But instead she said it the dumb person way, or well, the vernacular. Everyone speaks in this minute. But anyway, she left out various words, even in the vernacular. I identifying 30 different schools that this is happening to, in, with. 
within. Something. Say something. Jefferson County, there's a lot of this going on. So Jefferson County, she just told you, she's running for governor of every county in Colorado, including Jefferson County. She just told you outright that she fully believes that Jefferson County is full of freaks and morons. So go out and vote for her. All your kids think they're cats. I believe it because, what? Over, I just heard from over 100 parents identifying 30 different schools. All right, well, let's see. Fox 31 asked Jeffco Public Schools for comment, and a spokesperson said, quote, there is absolutely no truth to this claim. That's all that they said. I mean, you know, it's straightforward, but I mean, all right, there, I guess there's more here. There are no litter boxes in our buildings, and students are not allowed to come to school in costume. There are no furries or students identifying as such during the school day, a statement from the district said. And furthermore, we don't believe this person who made this accusation could ever have graduated from any school, ever, unless it was a terrible, terrible mistake made. The claim that students identify as furries has been spreading across the country for several months. A fact checked by Reuters in July determined that there was, quote, no evidence that U.S. school children are self-identifying as animals and disrupting classrooms. In April, the Associated Press did a fact check against a claim from Wisconsin. I don't think we heard about that one yet. That one district there had a furry protocol. The AP found this claim to be completely false. Ganal's exclusive one-on-one interview on Colorado Point of View follows a fiery debate in Puebla with Governor Jared Polis. Uh, now they're treating it as a serious story for the rest of it, blah, 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 pollings, etc. And I mean, the good news is, and you'll want to know this if you're outside of Colorado, you probably heard it if you're inside already, a recent Fox 31 slash Channel 2 slash Emerson College slash The Hill poll found that polis holds a 17 point lead over ganal in their race and frankly that's not enough it should be 80 90 100 points because one of the two candidates believes that there are children who think they're cats pooping in litter boxes and is certain that it's true because over 100 parents told her about 30 particular schools and apparently this reporter asks her point blank can you give one example this is the one who said well there are many many examples yes well how about one? Well, there are many. Yeah, well, how about one? Well, there are many. And it, this is enough. They should just, well, I'm throwing you off the show then because you're too stupid to be here. Goodbye. I might as well just, I should, not only should I, might as well be, uh, might as well I uh, interview Vermin's room. I should just talk to the boot. I'd get a better answer out of that. I don't know. This is driving me crazy, of course. And it's a big distraction from telling you about other stories that you should know about, oh, Republicans, how terrible they are, perhaps. Uh, perhaps, let's say, individuals, if you don't believe in tarring the whole group. We can point out plenty of individuals comprising nearly 100% of the Republican Party, if you want. Uh, let's see. Uh, stories to share. Hmm. How about this? Uh, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit, but go back to the Supreme Court uh, in general. Uh, despite the good news from today, and that is all good news, not only the beginning of the term, term, that's it, for uh, Justice Jackson, but the good news about uh, a few cases that they're declining to take, the stupid one from Mike Lindell and the gun uh, bump stocks case. Um, I saw over the weekend a uh, an interview that Amanda Marcotte had uh conducted with Dahlia Lithwick for which, uh, well, which I would recommend to you in, in total, but, um, for which there was at least one particular, um, excerpt that I thought was of great interest. And let me open up, uh, both here and say, well, I guess if I can open up the tweet, then eventually it'll lead to the, uh, interview itself, uh, which is in Salon and is titled, a quote, I guess, I had this nightmare, but I didn't know it was mine. That's the end of the quote. Dahlia Lithwick on Trump's crisis of law. She's got a book out called Lady Justice. In Lady Justice, the longtime legal reporter interrogates how female lawyers are coping with author- authoritarianism. A particularly interesting angle on the topic, I think. Um, 
And the interview, like I said, is a very good one. But this particular excerpt, I think, jumped out at me in terms of its uh, value for sharing and and, um, describing uh, the basic problem of a now possibly lawless Supreme Court. Uh, This one tweet in a thread of tweets about the lengthy interview in Salon. Some of Dahlia's thoughts, Amanda says, on what we're facing when so many Federalist judges have no respect for rule of law or the basic concept of justice. And this excerpt taken, uh, shared as a, as a screenshot from the Salon article. And it reads this way. The theme that you're pulling on, she says about Dahlia here to Dahlia is a theme that comes out so often in the book. Oh, or, or, actually, maybe am I thinking, is it in reverse? Have I set it up wrong? It might be Dahlia responding to, I, I guess I could try and find it inside the interview so you can tell uh, who's speaking to to who here. But I guess now it's starting to look like, I'll see if I'm scroll through the interview itself. It must be Dahlia answering uh, Amanda on this thing. And I guess w- what makes this such an interesting interview and it's such an interesting combination just for a conversation is that the conversation is, is it, it's as revealing in getting answers from Dahlia Lithwick um, as having Dahlia able to respond to Amanda's various theori- theories and her theorizing about, well, everything that's wrapped up in the article. So it's a two-way street, this interview, and I don't know which one I want to hear from more. It's interesting. Anyway, the theme that you're pulling on, it says here, is a theme that comes out so often in the book where you have different people essentially saying, I'm in love with my captor. I'm enthralled to this legal system. Several of them say, this is the only thing I know how to do. So this here is, I guess, Dahlia responding to Amanda and saying one of the problems that she's discovering here, and 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 it's not unique to women lawyers by any means, um, but lawyers in general, and I think this is kind of a fascinating point to make about this. I'm, I keep thinking about the number of respected and previously respected legal minds, even liberal-leaning legal minds, who said things like, Oh, well, you can trust Bill Barr. He's a straight shooter. Or, uh, you know, um, um, Brett Kavanaugh or even Neil Gorsuch, you know, they, they, you know, they play it by the book and, uh, you know, they're conservative to be sure. I think they said this more about Neil Gorsuch than anything else. Uh, but you know, you can, you can believe that he'll rely on solid legal reasoning, even if you don't always agree with it, et cetera. But lots of people vouching for conservative, uh, nominees to the Supreme Court and then finding out, wow, they're really actually quite gimmitarian, these players after all. Uh, and, and, and this may explain it. Uh, you know, this, this comes out a little bit uh, harsh in the beginning here. I'm in love with my captor, but you get the point here. I'm enthralled to this legal system. Several of them say, this is the only thing I know how to do. There is this deep reckoning that a lot of them are going through and that I, too, am going through. You've dedicated your life. You went to law school and you ordered your life around certain legal principles. And now the whole thing is a joke to people, not just because we've lost confidence in the Supreme Court or it now lacks the standing that it used to have, et cetera, et cetera, but because as I've been saying uh, about uh, various cases in particular, and as Armando has been saying in general for a long time, uh, the legal principles around which you ordered your life are not of interest to the people holding the gavels anymore. That you think that that's the case because they too went to law school, but they've realized at some point along the line that they don't have to do all the hard work that you all, both of you, did in law school in order to get where you are. You can now make it up as you go along and realize that if you're doing it from the bench, you know, from the Supreme Court bench, that you don't have to justify it and you don't have to defend it because there's nowhere to take an appeal to. And even if you're not doing it from that bench, if you're doing it from the federal district bench in South, the Southern District of Florida, 
you can go ahead and do that too. Uh, it used to be that you worried about being reversed on appeal, but now you don't even care. Sometimes it won't even happen that you get reversed on appeal. So, ah, so I'm being yelled at by my bosses. What else is new in life? I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing and at the very least create problems and waste the time of the 11th circuit for as long as I can and it doesn't bother them. Uh, but there's more to this screen grab here. But uh, I thought it was very profound, uh, really, that, you know, why people cling to this notion of, well, they just won't because they can't. They, they've never done anything quite like that. There's no precedent for this. Or the things they're doing, it's not allowed by the rules. It won't work. They can't just say these things. Well, why not? Well, because... I don't know. I was trained that you couldn't, and they were trained that you couldn't. And if you can now, then I don't even know what I've been doing with my life. Well, it's a very heavy burden to carry, but guess what? I mean, what you're having is a personal crisis, but the rest of us are having to deal with the fact that, yeah, these people are just doing whatever they want in very gimmitarian fashion. And I'm hoping that as our, you know, some of our leading intellectual lights, you will get up to speed shortly about the fact that all rule of law is out the window. And I don't know what to recommend that you, you know, how, how you ought to order your life from here on in if it's all out the window. But I, I, I need you to have some eyes on this and, and catch up with it or get past your shock and start dealing with these things the way they really are. And there's plenty more in this second paragraph of the screen cap here. Let's get to that. If one single unelected judge in Florida, hmm, who might that be, decides that selling classified nuclear secrets is cool, then we're all just stymied by that. I, first of all, you're stymied by that. How could anybody possibly come to that decision? And then if you spend too long saying, but how could it be? How could it be? And the, the, the case progresses while you're sputtering and nothing happens and we don't come up with any kind of coherent response. There may not be one because the, the initiating comments from the judge aren't, you know, rational in any way. So how do we respond to it? But yeah, uh, and, and to the extent that we remain in thrall to the legal system, like it's a really good thing. And it was once when everybody played by the rules. If one side abandons the rules, it's not such a great thing anymore. And, you know, maybe we ought not to be stymied by that. But I don't know, like, what to suggest in its place. And she gets to that in this paragraph. If one single unelected judge in Florida decides that selling classified nuclear secrets is cool, then we're all just stymied by that. But where I come back to, and here's where she begins to deal with this. Law is all we have. It's not like there's a second best system. There is one, and she identifies it. The second best system, I often say, is the army. But that's just what Steve Bannon wants, a world of power and violence. I don't want to get into a world where the number of guns I have is determinative of how much power I have because I'm really screwed. And not just because, well, you might say, well, is you, maybe you can fix the imbalance in guns. Yeah, but you're, you're screwed in a different way. Even if you all have the same amount of guns, or even if you have many more guns than the other side, you're screwed because, you know, uh, well, all the systems that we've devised for ourselves in order to avoid settling everything by violence, you know, they've allowed a lot of good things to happen. Inventing Roombas, air conditioning, uh, being able to collect things and keep them in your house and not worry about having to defend them all the time, whether that be baseball cards that you're interested in or food or people that you collect as part of your family and they shouldn't be dragged away in chains and enslaved somewhere, whatever it is. Uh, you know, it's pretty bad news if it comes down to that. Uh, we're back to life being, uh, as they said, pre-societally, uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And even if you have the same amount of weapons, it's just bad news in general. Law is all we have, and there is no second best system. And if there is one, it's just every man for themselves, every person for themselves, and we just shoot everybody who gets in our way. And that's not a life. At that point. And as we've said before on the show, of course, that's the end of law as we know it. That's the end of rights because rights that are 
supposedly ex- in existence or are only enforceable from behind a gun, not actually rights at all. They're just plunder, whatever I can take from people. If I say I have the right to this property and the only way I really have rights to that property is to kill all other claimants to the property forever in perpetuity, I don't really have any right to the property or right to anything else for that matter. Uh, if I can only have free speech by killing everyone who would oppose me, eh, it's not a right. It's just whatever you're able to take with your gun. So where were we? Right. The second best system is the army. That's what Steve Bannon wants. A world of power and violence. I don't want to get into that because then I'd be really screwed. The ambivalence you're detecting and that you're feeling is something that most of the women in this book have grappled with. If there were a plan B where we could affect massive world change through breakdancing or being a mime or anything like that. Oh, I see I've already uh, run up against things without even so much as my outro music. We'll take our break and be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. But I think now, for the rest of the people rejoining us during the break, also without the uh, intro music, uh, all right, well, it'll be very confusing and uh, exciting and new for all of you joining us. Yeah, I think what just happened here, I was so interested in getting through this Dahlia Lithwick quote here that I, uh, I, I, I got the alarm that told me I should be on alert to get the music ready in 30 seconds, but I talked past the 30 second thing. And then it was time for the break. And then uh, without the music running, it's difficult to know uh, how long is the break supposed to be lasting after all. All right. Where were we? Uh, we were on another planet, apparently. I was reading through the screen grab from Dahlia Lithwick, and I just got to the funny part, <clears throat> or at least the uh, the amusing part of, of her explaining the thing. But we were saying, <sighs> to start over again, right? Um, whence you realize that it's all out the window on law and order and all the legal training that you've had is of no interest whatsoever to the supposedly conservative judge. Like how do you be conservative by throwing law and order out the window? I don't know. It just is. Uh, And it's all just a matter of power. I can make people do these things or I can convince the army to shoot them if they don't do these things because I'm a judge and everybody knows that the Constitution says the judges are supposed to be listened to and that's all there is. And she says the ambivalence you're detecting is that you're feeling uh, and that you're feeling is something that most women in the book have grappled with and I think everybody's grappling with. If there were a plan B, like for a different system besides the rule of law, that where we could affect massive world change through breakdancing or being a mime, I would be for those things. But I don't see another locus of massive organizing power and justice other than law. And we've kind of just grown up to defend, to define it that way. Like what is justice? Well, it's the rule of law. Well, what is justice? Like they are different things, but that's how we define them. If we eliminate the rule of law, What's justice? Like what passes for justice in that scenario? And the only answer is, I guess it's being able to intimidate or kill everyone who's in your way until you get what you think is fair given to you. But how fair is it given that you're executing people in order to get it? I don't know. Or threatening to. Uh, Yeah, it doesn't feel like justice. Or you might say maybe there's no such thing as justice without the rule of law. 
Well, you know, maybe it's just that what passes for justice isn't, uh, you know, like necessarily it does it's harder to pass it off as objectively being fair, but everyone would have a sense of justice. Uh, a person did a bad thing to me. Well, you'd go back to like an eye for an eye, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. A person has done a bad thing to me. They took my eye. Justice is taking their eye. Well, that's the way it used to be. And then rule of law, and uh, although that was supposed to be a law, but a rule of a better law was, well, maybe we'll put that person in jail instead. I don't know why that's necessarily better, but it does tend to keep, you know, the murder rate, generally speaking, uh, under better check than it used to be back in the day. But yeah, uh, so no, certainly no other massive organizing power of justice other than law, nothing that would be universally recognized as being fair across multiple cultures in multiple countries. Uh, and as she says, I certainly don't find one that would be to the benefit of women, especially if it was simply a matter of settling things through violence or the threat of violence, where men tend to kind of have the franchise on that. And they don't, if there's nothing holding them to any standard of fairness toward women or anyone else for that matter, then it'll just be might making right and so long as the locus of might remains among the males uh you know in in general then uh, things will probably come out poorly for everyone else who might want a piece of the pie anyway i just thought that was kind of that sort of encapsulated the whole thing and it uh it collapses on itself very quickly and you you see it's it's very worrisome and uh can lead to a sort of hopelessness and despair uh but I guess it's just, I guess you could take away from it the, as a rallying point. Uh, this is the importance of restoring and maintaining the rule of law because what comes next is chaos. And there's no other way of putting it. At any rate, uh, so it's a very interesting interview and setup and, of course, a very interesting book about which the discussion is, uh, around which the discussion is centered. Um, so there's more to it. And more to the exchange between the two. But I thought that was the big takeaway from all that. And so much so that it screwed up my third break entirely. So now that I ought to tell you something. So again, I recommend it to you. I had this nightmare, but I didn't know it was mine. Dahlia Lithwick on Trump's crisis of law in Salon. So take a look for it. Let's see. Other things I wanted to update you with and let you know what's going on. Well, let's see. Um, I, we'll, we'll stick with... Uh, uh, the women on this one. Amanda Carpenter, who I don't usually borrow from very often, but is writing in the bulwark, and we pay some attention to that because it's never Trumpy ish, and explains some of the inner workings in the Republican Party, to which all of the never Trumpers will happily return once uh, a person that they approve of having oppressed the rest of us takes the reins there. I understand and recognize that. But in the meantime, let's look at what's being exposed. Kevin McCarthy's plan to Benghazi the Bidens. I think we all know that it's coming, but this is some interesting analysis of the situation. Get ready for the Hunter Biden hearings. I think we all know, like I said, that that's coming. Amanda Carpenter writes in the bulwark. Uh, seven years ago, when House Speaker John Boehner resigned after years of frustration over trying to corral the far right of his caucus, Kevin McCarthy was favored to succeed him. That is, until one night on Sean Hannity's show, McCarthy said the quiet part out loud in discussing why House Republicans had poured so much time and energy into investigating the Benghazi attack. And the quote, of course, was, Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. McCarthy's fellow Republicans decried the comments and called on him to apologize. He tried to backtrack. It didn't work. Ultimately, he had to give up on his bid for the speakership. Ironically, the brain-wormed partisan mindset that cost McCarthy the gavel in 2015 is probably why he'll get it in 2023. Remember, after all, Amanda is a Republican and 
more inclined to believe that Republicans will take the reins. But even the neutral observers still say that although the margin would be razor thin, the likelihood is still that Republicans, in their view, would take over control of the House. He faces a similar a challenge similar to Boehner's. He needs to contain the members of the MAGA caucus, or at least distract them with some shiny object. His solution harks back to his 2015 Kinsley gaffe about the Benghazi investigation. McCarthy really uh, recently unveiled a commitment to America, a knockoff of Newt Gingrich's 1994 contract with America that promises as one of its four planks to hold government accountable. By that, McCarthy means investigations, and the Biden family is at the top of the list. McCarthy's plan to Benghazi the Bidens isn't subtle. In July, he co-wrote a New York Post op-ed with Representatives Jim Jordan and James Comer, the top Republicans on the Judiciary and Oversight Committees, titled, quote, We'll investigate Biden's shady business dealings when Republicans take the House in November. The placement of the op-ed was deliberate. The New York Post is where the story about Hunter Biden's laptop controversially originated. Comer, who stands in line to take over the chairmanship of the Oversight Committee, has for many months made Biden family investigation a key focus of the minority staff of the committee. It is, he says, a matter of national security to know if President Biden is compromised because of his son's shady business dealings with foreign adversaries. If Comer becomes chairman, he says, we're ready to go in January. The Democrat Party, the Biden administration, big tech, the swamp, even Hollywood. Yeah, sure. OK. And others have done everything in their power to run cover for the Biden family. He said in a press release last month, Russian sanctions on the Biden family are, Comer claims, evidence of Hunter's business schemes with our adversaries or adversaries, if you prefer, who see the president's son as a pressure point to exploit an example of the kind of investigative trails Comer intends to go down. He recently told Hannity he has, quote, proof that President Biden was involved in a 2017 deal to sell American natural gas to China, prompted by Hannity about whether the president needs to be investigated for basically selling out his office. Comer replied, I think it's safe to say that the oversight investigation of Hunter Biden is now shifting to an investigation of Joe Biden. I mean, it's safe to say that because they're going to make it that way. But is there any truth to the rest of the stuff? Are you finding evidence of things? No? Okay, well, it doesn't matter. McCarthy, Comer, and Jordan are by no means the only high-ranking Republicans with Hunter Biden on the brain. The Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, is taking a more muted approach, but he has clearly signaled his support for making investigations of the Biden family a centerpiece of Republican politics for the remainder of the Biden administration. McConnell's focus for now is a federal probe into Hunter Biden's finances that began in 2018, before Joe Biden announced his 2020 presidential candidacy, even before Donald Trump pressured Ukrainian officials to dig up dirt on Biden. It is bizarre that four years later, this investigation remains unresolved, a situation McConnell is taking advantage of. Given the lag, Republican senators are trying to raise questions about political interference in the Department of Justice and asking that the Trump-appointed U.S. attorney handling the case be given special counsel authorities and protections. Last month, McConnell and 32 other Republican senators, one-third of the Senate, sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland requesting these expanded investigative powers. In their letter, the GOP senators list examples of supposed politicization of the Justice Department, ranging from COVID measures, the search of Mar-a-Lago, and, quote, neglect in protecting Supreme Court justices and pro-life activists from violence, and said that turning the department's extant Biden inquiry into a special counsel investigation would go a long way in restoring faith in our governmental institutions. Oh, boy. Although the GOP senators concede that they have, quote, no way of knowing the entire scope of the investigation, they claim that, quote, 
Evidence seems to be mounting that Hunter Biden committed numerous federal crimes, including but not limited to tax fraud, money laundering, and foreign lobbying violations. Based on what, exactly? The Senate Republicans pointed to previous investigations by Senators Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson. Those investigations' final reports were released in the fall of 2020, and largely echoed accusations that then-President Trump made about the Bidens related to Burisma, the accusations that led to Trump's first impeachment. Like McCarthy's accidental admission about the political purpose of the Benghazi investigations, Johnson wasn't coy about the timing of his investigation of Hunter Biden, saying in August 2020 radio interview, anyone, uh, I would like to think it would certainly help Donald Trump win re-election. And certainly be pretty good, I would say, evidence about not voting for President, Vice President Biden. If the 2023 investigations into the Biden's bomb and the, as the 2020 investigations did, McCarthy has plenty of backup options for keeping his caucus marching in step. Investigations into the FBI's search of Mar-a-Lago. The immigration crisis, quote unquote, I would say, the Afghanistan withdrawal and the origins of the coronavirus are also on tap. And why not furries as well? Theoretically, any of those issues could serve as the basis for an impeachment vote in a future Republican House. This might explain why Republicans like Representative Nancy Mace say it's likely Republicans would impeach Biden if they win in November without articulating why. For many Republicans, impeaching Biden is more about payback for the Trump impeachments than policy. As ten Senator Ted Cruz puts it, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, which is amazing for all of us who, of course, remember the interest in impeaching George W. Bush for his torture policies, for his uh, warrantless wiretapping policies and various other violations of law here in the United States. Uh, and it was all dismissed by the uh, savvy news media as, oh, well, everyone knows that impeaching Bush would just be tit for tat for the Clinton impeachment. It's just be Democrats trying to get back at Republicans for that. And that's obviously invalid. And that stuck. And maybe it was just because it was leveled against Democrats. But I mean, here, Republicans are actually saying, yes, that would actually be our intention here. And it's still not sticking for some reason. Gee whiz. McCarthy's biggest problem, however, isn't creating a basis for impeachment. It's giving his members something to do besides impeaching Biden. One could see a scenario in which Representative Murdery Trader Green, for instance, and she had some comments over the weekend that justify the nickname, calls fruitlessly for impeachment votes as often as the Tea Party called for Obamacare repeal votes in the Boehner-Ryan House era. In fact, House Republicans have already introduced 14 resolutions to impeach Biden and members of his administration. So, investigations it is. For McCarthy, they are both a 2022 campaign promise and what he hopes will serve as the partisan glue to keep his raucous, cock his raucous caucus. That's amazing. United for the 2024 elections. If impeachment follows, so be it. It's just a toy after all. Remember, it doesn't need to be regarded seriously. Remember that that was, of course, the attack. You people, not only are you doing things tick for tat, you're taking some of the most serious provisions of the United States Constitution and making it your political plaything. Oh, were you, now you're planning to do that? But isn't that hypocrisy? No, because something. Give me Tarianism, I guess. One final point. The Benghazi investigation wasn't originally about Hillary Clinton's emails, just as Ken Starr's Whitewater investigation wasn't originally about Monica Lewinsky. But that's what was uncovered, and that's what the public remembers. Who wants to make predictions where an open-ended Biden investigation that already involves a crack pipe and sects could end up? Okay, that's a good question. I don't actually want to make those predictions, but there you have it. So uh, up to speed on that. And I thought a good analysis generally of what's going on. And another opportunity to uh, once again point out that, yeah, again, the media, the so-called liberal media will set us up one more time. It was absolutely unacceptable to have a tit-for-tat insinuation 
about impeaching George W. Bush, who had very good reason to face impeachment. And now it's perfectly reasonable for Republicans to openly admit, look, we're doing this because uh, you did this to Trump. So we're going to get you back. Whether or not Biden actually did anything is besides the point. All right. Let's see. Other things to share with you. Uh, Oh, you know what? Why don't we use this opportunity to catch up on a couple of other things? Well, first of all, I should make mention of the fact, uh, or I will grab for you the uh, latest craziness from Murdery Trader Green. But uh, apparently she showed up at Trump's Michigan, was it Michigan rally uh, that they did over the weekend and uh, made the the totally sane comments of uh, telling people, I believe the the grab quote was, I don't want, I won't mince words with you all, you all, uh, because she's, you know, Southern genteel Southern lady, et cetera. Uh, Democrats want Republicans dead and they've already started the killings. Just threw that out there for red meat for the base. And boy, they booed that. They didn't like that at all. We've already started murdering Republicans. For instance, she says, I don't know. She, and she came up with a couple of stories. Um, at least one of which I had uh, pointed out to me was just being told wrong. But this is apparently another of the hot button issues for the Republicans is that um, the um, uh, that that a well, I don't know whether it happened in Michigan or not it may have happened in Michigan, um, but that um, a anti-abortion activist was shot. You know, and then they're telling merely for working hard to protect babies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's a million problems with that rhetoric. But yeah, apparently uh, the story was uh, a little iffy in the way she told it. But she says uh, she was shot merely for advocating for the unborn. And Ira Goldman pointed out to me, no, it's just actually quite wrong in the telling of this. Apparently, where was it? I'll say, uh, yes, it was in Michigan in Odessa Township in Michigan, uh, where it was a, in a rather elderly lady who was, in fact, shot. And that's bad news. Uh, but apparently the fuller story is that she was doing door-to-door uh, getting in people's faces, door-to-door haranguing them about uh, abortion, where in Michigan they're having uh, the uh, ballot initiative vote uh, about whether or not to uh, leave enshrined in the state constitution the protections for abortion. She was looking for people, you know, she's doing canvassing. But apparently she decided that this is one house anyway. She was just not going to leave. She was ta- not taking no for an answer, uh, even though she's canvassing for the no position. That, But you know how the saying goes. And uh, apparently she was asked to leave the property several times. People were insisting that she get lost. And then somebody thought it would be a brilliant thing to do to brandish a 22 caliber rifle from the barn and to fire a warning shot at the tree nearby. But guess what happened? The warning shot didn't go very well. And the woman was hit, but not, you know, terribly, uh, you know, was, wasn't killed. And, uh, you know, with all these things, we, I, I hate to I hesitate to say she'll make a full recovery. She's elderly. She was shot, apparently grazed, but hit in the shoulder and not shot in the back as Marjorie or murdery trader green would have it. She was shot in the back because she was leaving because she was complying with the demand because she respects property rights. Apparently the bullet hit her in the shoulder and exited her back. So she's got a bullet wound in her back, but you know how these things go through the game of telephone, et cetera, et cetera, all around generally irresponsible on all sides, I would say. But that's the, that's the killing, which wasn't the killing, which didn't take place and didn't happen because Democrats were killing Republicans, but because somebody was having a crazy reaction to somebody being on their property. But that's actually a big uh, issue for having too many guns in circulation, but she doesn't want to talk about it in that way. So at any rate, but that, that's how she spent her weekend, drumming up, uh, 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 well, hatred by using rhetoric like that. As usual, it's just, it's escalating and it's getting kind of crazy out there. All right, let's see. Uh, was that one I wanted to, uh, I was, I was making the transition over to something else and I stopped on that one but all right so many other things to share with you it's hard to know exactly which one we should make next but let's uh, try this one here because we're running a little bit 
lower on time than I thought. Uh, why don't we add... Uh, oh, no, I remember what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring you up to speed to follow up on other stories that we had talked about last week about which I had gotten new information. So uh, information coming in from listeners Judy Vincent, who uh, contributes very frequently, uh, you know, little uh, snippets of correction and such. And uh, let's see, where else did I get this news? This one was parked in email, so I'll have to find my... I think I starred it so that I would be able to find it again. Ah, yeah, here we are. And uh, David Paquette, both chiming in on, remember the story about Trump becoming confused, and now we're all confused, so I actually have some sympathy for Donald Trump in one instance here, becoming confused by speaking to a high-ranking public health service official who had appeared at the official meeting in what looks an awful lot like a Navy uniform, because that's the way we deal with our public health service here. And there's a reason for it, and it's all explained in the various explainers that I got. Um, but but there's some contradictory discussion or some contradictory points made. So it's ser- it's clearly a very confusing area. I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, let's see. First, I heard from Judy Vincent. So let me read Judy's. And she had this to say, uh, I'm not an expert on the public health service, but as a retired army doctor, I thought I might be able to shed a little bit of light. The PHS is not military. I mean, but it, but it has military like structure. It's not military and it does not participate in wars. The public health service is not military, but it does have uniformed professionals who wear uniforms patterned after the U.S. Navy, and they have ranks based on Navy ranks. I know, that's confusing, right? When they are at work, i.e. on duty, they wear their uniform, which is their normal work clothing. So it wasn't like he was tricking Trump by, you know, or, or doing something and I'll show up in uniform and then he'll think I'm an admiral. He just, like, showed up to work like he normally was. Therefore, when... Admiral, and they do call him Admiral, Jirwa, uh, to, wore his uniform to the White House. He was appropriately dressed because he was at work. I would have been wrong, or it would have been wrong for him not to wear his uniform. When I did my infectious diseases fellowship at Walter Reed, I frequently ran into public health service doctors whom I always confused with Navy doctors. I am sending this Wikipedia link, which is very helpful, and it is. And I'll pass it on to you and share it. And they do, you know, also wear the ribbons on their uniforms, but they are for service in the public health service, not for combat. They're not combat decorations as you would often see in in military folks. Now, on the other hand, and the public health service Wikipedia article is fascinating in its own right. I got this from David Paquette, who sent to me, coincidentally, he says, I know about that public health service practice of wearing uniforms, dress uniforms in formal settings. I think that the article you read about the public health service physician whose uniform confused the orange buffoon overstated the man's, quote, rank of admiral. This is interesting, too. What you need to know is that the public health service uses U.S. Navy rank equivalents for its employees. So, for instance, at the very least, you could say, well, somebody who is the equivalent of an admiral, would be at least a very important person in the public health service at the top of it. But they're not important people in the Navy because they're not in the Navy. But there's some twists, okay? So uh, the PHS uses U.S. Navy rank equivalents for its employees who, as they advance in the service, advance through the same Navy alphanumerical ranks and ratings, like, for instance, a chief petty officer is an E7, uh, chief warrant officer, W5, full, full admiral would be an O10, etc. They have their whole uh, nomenclature for the ranks. This is a throwback, uh, as it turns out. Why do they do this? It's a throwback to its original 1798 founding, the Public Health Service, as what was then known as the, quote, Marine Hospital Service, a medical team whose duties involved caring for injured and ailing sailors. As it happened, 
about th- happens about 35 years ago, David says, my mom's kid brother was extremely highly placed in the PHS about after about 20 years of working in its medical records inspection department, he was put in charge of the PHS's Baltimore facility where medical records inspectors were trained. In that role, he was a director and reported directly to Surgeon General, everyone's favorite famous Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop. My uncle was not considered an admiral and he did not normally wear a uniform at work. That was kind of interesting, too. That's uh, contradictory to what we heard from Judy. But I've, certainly if you were showing up at the White House, you might, in fact, do that. But maybe not day-to-day in the you know bowels of the Baltimore facility. But he would wear the uniform on ceremonial occasions. For HR purposes, he had an O10 rating, which he told me gave him the equivalent of an admiral's rank within the PHS, But this is where the article's author may have gotten confused. The only time that his uncle wore a full dress uniform was when he drove into D.C. from Baltimore every week to meet with Dr. Koop. Without close inspection, you might have mistaken him for an admiral, except that his uniform had PHS buttons and insignia. One of the perks, this was funny, of the PHS is that its employees and retirees can use the post exchange system of tax exempt stores that military runs on all its bases. My aunt tells fun stories about going to the PX at Newport, Rhode Island Naval Base to shop. A retiree's ID does not indicate service history, just rating. So whenever they showed up, and the uncle presented his ID, a young sailor at the door would jump to his feet and bawl out, Attend, hut! And everyone around them would snap to attention. And this would both embarrass my uncle and make my aunt giggle uncontrollably. Uh, and apparently this happened all the time. And then they gave up on trying to explain to everybody, no, no, no. And he just learned to say, at ease. And then everybody went From about their business. Radio.com. <laughs> you have been listening to Kegro in the morning. So how about that for some background? We always can count on our audience to have a good story about these things and give us some explanation. So I guess we got to give Trump a pass on that one. That was not uh, even near the worst thing that he did that day, I'm sure. Now stay tuned for Justice Putnam with West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy bringing you more about the other bad things he's done, I'm sure.